Welcome to the second session of Land, Sea and Sky, the Archaeology of Coasts and Islands, a National Monument Service online conference in partnership with the OPW and organised by Archaeology Ireland. This session has a strong island theme and begins with a presentation by Paul Gosling, an archaeologist who lectures part-time in the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. Paul was a joint editor of Volumes 4 and 5 of the Royal Irish Academy's news survey of Clare Island in Clew Bay, County Mayo, and is an active member of the Interdisciplinary Survey of Island Eddy in Galway Bay. Both of these projects are the subject of this presentation, Different Islands, Different Approaches, Surveying the Built Heritage of Clare Island, Clew Bay and Island Eddy, Galway Bay. Many will be familiar with the famous multidisciplinary survey of Clare Island that took place between 1909 and 1915 and involved scholars such as Thomas Westrop and Robert Lloyd Prager, and the new survey of Clare Island that took place and was published between 1991 and 2019. In this presentation, Paul will be comparing and contrasting the Clare Island surveys with a much smaller scale interdisciplinary survey conducted by a community group on Island Eddy, a small but strategic and now uninhabited island in Galway Bay, which began in 2010. The contrasting scope and scale of the two surveys provide an opportunity for comparison not only of results, but also of issues such as access, funding, community engagement and the distribution of results. This is a story of uh, one archaeologist's engagement with two islands over a period of uh, 30 years, between 1990 and uh, the present. Uh, my name is Paul Gosling and um, I'll be gazing off to the left uh, and downwards occasionally in order to consult my notes if you excuse um, the movement. So let's begin. We have two islands, Clare Island in Clew Bay and Island Eddy in Galway Bay. They are uh, different in scale and considerably different in terms of their geography. And one island is uninhabited, that is Island Eddy, since 1982. And the other Clare Island has a community which has rode out, as it were, the vicissitudes of uh, living in a peripheral location in Ireland and has a healthy community um, right to the present day. Working with both um, islands has meant that I've come in contact with both communities um, because even though Island Eddy is abandoned, there are survivors, um, um, two of the uh, last inhabitants still live locally and there are uh, scores of uh, grandnieces and nephews um, who remember fondly their times uh, on these islands in their childhood. There are interesting stories about the islands in terms of their names uh, and as I've noted there on the screen uh, various people including Artem Whalefowl and Charles Doherty, um, one a place names expert the other a uh, historian, have um, made comments uh, as to the potential origin of these names and uh, I'm not sure whether uh, islands um, names are, are universally uh, ancient, I suspect not, but certainly some island names are and perhaps island names uh, once um, given uh, perhaps persist uh, longer than in other places. It's often felt that islands are, um, as it were, reservoirs of tradition um, but in fact, um, their placement on the sea coasts, uh, in this case, the sea coast of the west of Ireland, means that they're open to influences um, and ideas, if not population movements, in a way which um, was not possible for more inland areas. So there's a dynamic in islands um, that is quite fascinating and which uh, is therefore perhaps surprising that their names have endured uh, if Umwe Fell and Doherty are correct. There's also something to be said about the location of the islands in terms of their control of uh, waterways. As I've stated, um, Clare Island sits at the mouth of Clue Bay and concluded all access into that bay, including the very, very um, lucrative fisheries that were located there, particularly in medieval times. Quoting from uh, Con Manning, uh, his work on Clare Island as published in uh, the Royal Irish Academy, 
he mentions that uh, report by Sir Nicholas Malby, Governor of Connacht, who in 1580 uh, noted that up to 50 English sailing boats come into Clue Bay to fish each year, paying a large tribute to the Omolia because, quote, it was accounted one of the best fishing places in Ireland for salmon, herring and all kinds of fish. A parallel story for um, Island Eddy um, would focus on a French frigate who in 1691, when you consider it, what was happening in Ireland in 1691, the fact that a French frigate was making a, um, 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 taking fathom uh, measurements and producing a detailed nautical chart of Galway Bay is quite remarkable in itself. Um, but one of the features of the reports um, which accompany the maritime chart made by that French um, boat is the fact that they note that the ships coming into Galway Bay stand off at the small island, which would be Deer Island um, off Ballyvahan, or the point, which would be Kilcolgan Point, to await pilots to bring them into the harbours of the eastern end of the bay. Uh, fascinating to think that these islands had a role in what is called pilotage, um, the safe passage of boats to uh, anchorages um, and then the return journey out to the open sea. So we can see, in a sense, um, by th those particular examples, the dynamic quality of uh, life. Topography, as I've mentioned, is a very, very big contrast between the two places. Clare Island, um, in terms of size, as you can see there, is 1,640 hectares as compared to um, yes, just a mere 67 hectares of Island Eddy. But the Island Eddy um, acreage or hectareage is, um, it is, as we shall see, um, slightly deceptive um, because the spits and lagoons um, which uh, fringe the island uh, and the three uh, drumlins which, which form its backbone, um, they give it a much bigger footprint um, than a simple reckoning of hectareage would um, allow for. This is a comparison of the two islands um, using the excellent uh, Ordnance Survey of Ireland Discovery Series maps uh, surveyed or, or, or plotted at a scale of 1 to 50,000. This means that the grid lines that you can see on the map um, represent one kilometre and you can get a sense here of the different scale, uh, not only of the uh, hectareage of the island, but just the, uh, I suppose, the footprints of both places. And you can see now the what I'm saying about the um, the cobble spits which fringe um, Island Eddy. You can also see that Island Eddy is only about three kilometres in uh, length, about east west, as opposed to the 78 kilometres, which um, is the, uh, the the east west distance for, for Clare Island. And you can also see, um, if you look closely at these um, maps, um, that there is um, the very fine peak of Knockmore uh, topping out at 480. Um, meters and then Island Eddy, which tops out uh, at only eight meters above sea level. So two very, very different places in terms of their uh, geography. Access to the islands today, uh, and I would think historically as well, um, is laid out here. The uh, interesting thing to note here is that both islands have multiple points of access. Um, there will be a preferred point of access, which for Clare Island would be Runa. Um, I can remember once um, being taken by Peter Gill uh, from Clare Island, um, failing to land at Runa because of the high seas and having to divert to Clockmore, which meant, of course, that we had to double back and make a, uh, from my point of view, um, and from his as well, a double length journey. And we landed at Clockmore and I had to get a taxi back to collect my car at Runa, which cost the princely sum of around £45 in 1991, 1992. Island Eddy, in contrast, is quite close to the mainland. Um, the traditions in many cases talk about people from their um, schooling or um, boarding in Balnacorti, which of course is to the north of the island, would give access to Orne Moor, where schools um, would be um, most conveniently sourced. Um, but it's also interesting to think of the connections between the island and Killian Aran, which are in many ways much stronger. For instance, there's no burial ground on Island Eddy, and traditionally people from there are buried in the uh, very old graveyard at Drumacoo, um, which is just a short distance beyond Killian Aran. 
The surveys of both islands that I've been involved in um, were of a very different order. And the Clare Island Survey, sponsored by the Royal Irish Academy, Academy in Dublin, uh, began in 1991. Um, and you can see there the, as it were, the methodology that we used in order to conduct the surveys. And the surveys uh, that have been doing, and I suppose are still ongoing in Island Eddy, have been of a much more informal nature. The fact that there is um, um, a ferry service between Clare Island and Runa, uh, as opposed to Island Eddy, where there's no ferry, means that uh, informal um, is important here because we're relying on people to bring us to the island or um, using boats um, which are in possession of the uh, survey participants. The second uh, aspect of the surveys is the avoidance of archaeological excavation in the Island Eddy um, uh, survey, whereas this was an integral part of the work um, which was done on Clare Island and innovative for that because archaeological survey traditionally uh, shoes, um, certainly in the Republic of Ireland, is shoes archaeological excavation. In the north of Ireland, traditionally, um, excavation and survey went part uh, hand in hand. But in the south of Ireland, this has not been the case historically. Um, um, that is until the advent, of course, of the discovery program um, uh, and the projects mounted by them. Um, so this was uh, to a degree uh, innovative for its time in the 1990s. In terms of the um, results that we got and the uh, archaeology of the places, this um, map is seeking to give you some of the highlights of the archaeology and built heritage of uh, Clare Island. Looking through those lists, um, one can begin as early as um, around about 3,000 to 2,500, um, sorry, 3,000 to 4,000 BC with the megalithic tomb, the court tomb, which was uncovered um, just um, before um, the Royal Irish Academy survey got underway. Uh, and you can come right up to the lighthouses and signal towers. Um, which are part of um, coastal infrastructure put in place by the British government in the um, early 19th century. One for navigation um, and the second for coastal defence in the case of the signal tower um, at Bonamohan. If we break down these um, monuments on Clare Island, of which there's a total of 256 recorded, um, we can see here in the frequency chart um, just how this breaks down. Um, houses and huts, which are a very amorphous group because some of these could potentially only be 100 years old. Others um, uh, certainly date back to the um, Bronze Age, perhaps even the Neolithic. Um, we can see um, below that um, a very homogeneous group of monuments, Fulloch the Fia. Uh, none of these were recorded during the previous uh, survey work on Clare Island in large part because they weren't recognised as field monuments until the work of Professor O'Kelly in Cork in the 1950s. And you can break down this uh, list and um, look at the various frequencies. Um, the one thing we're going to look at in detail out of this is the castle. Only one castle on uh, Clare Island and one castle on Island Eddy. But they are classic uh, monuments of any archaeological survey and therefore it might be worth just making some comparison between the two uh, sites. If we look on Island Eddy, um, what you, uh, I suppose, strikes one immediately is the dearth of monuments. Um, I've only highlighted five different locations here, um, but uh, there are some very interesting um, and quite striking monuments on this island, which are not to be found, or certainly not preserved um, on um, um, Clare Island. And that includes, firstly, the Noss, and secondly, the seaweed weed markers. So if we look at these results in a tabulated form, as it were, um, 256 archaeological, historical and architectural entries published in the published catalogue, volume five of the new survey of Clare Island, published by the Royal Irish Academy in 2007. Um, but then you must um, break this down and, and realise that there are certain things in that 256 entries um, that reduce the total, uh, principally things like non-antiquities, monuments declared to be uh, archaeological, but in fact proving not to be. Uh, and then um, portable objects, which are generally not enumerated in archaeological survey, even though they should be. Island Eddy, um, I've given a total there for 14 historical architectural, um, and I'm calling them items, um, trying to be more modest, perhaps. Uh, well, more cautious, maybe, since um, my time in Clare Island. And um, this includes 
nine seaweed markers and you'd wear well, what size is a seaweed marker um it's only about um less than 50 centimeters height and it's a block of stone with a number carved on it so you know nothing to write home about there one would think but metrics as we all know um in uh, in, in economic terms and more recently um, listening to the stats to do with COVID-19, uh, metrics show and hide a huge amount of material um, and um, in many cases uh, do not tell the full story. So if we take that classic monument type, the Irish Castle, and look at the um, Clare Island example, you can see here um, the very finely preserved, as it appears, um, block of the castle, rectangular footprint, earliest record, late 16th century, associated solely with the O'Malley family because of their uh, dominance in Ool, um, that is the area um, around the north and the east ends of Clue Bay, uh, and then its conversion into a police barracks in 1826, which of course mightn't have helped um, in terms of uh, local fondness for the monument uh, in the 19th century. Um, that conversion um, completely stripped out the whole interior fittings of the medieval castle. So what you've got today is what looks like a quite impressively well-preserved tower. Um, but when you look at the interior fittings, you realise that there's very little left of the original um, fabric or layout in the interior, which is unfortunate, um, but nevertheless, uh, still an impressive monument from the area. When you come to uh, Isla Dedi Castle, um, you get into a very humble situation where there's very little to see. A stump of masonry built into a field wall at the east end of the island, uh, close to the uh, landing point, which you can see there in the background left, uh, just some of the landing point looking towards the mainland. We have an earlier record for this castle than that for Clare Island, and we have very interesting associations with uh, particular families, the Skerrits being one of the uh, principal mercantile families of Galway, who appear to have had possession of uh, at least a part of Island Eddy in the 16th century. And when you consider that the O'Flaherty's um, in South Connemara were taking tribute or rent out of Island Eddy in the later 16th century, you get the sense that this is an island um, which, like Clare Island, had considerable connections uh, along and across um, the wide Bay of Galway. This castle collapsed, um, according to local tradition, sometime in the early 19th century. Um, and we have some sense of it, uh, its height, because of the preservation of fabric in surrounding ruined walls, um, but also because the tradition states that when it fell, uh, the stones from it scattered right down to the sea, suggesting that it was a relatively tall structure. All of those stones were plundered and then built um, into walls and houses on the mainland. And again, that fascinated me. Uh, and I learned a lesson from from this that the the um, most economic way to transport stone until the advent of the classic Irish lorry um, in the 1950s was by sea. So this was a a much sought after source of stone for a number of generations, until we get to the present day where you'd simply have this stump of masonry as the only remnant of the castle. But a lot of stories um, current in the area about um, where the stone from the castle. Those two monuments, the castles on um, both islands, are very discrete monuments. They're the classic monument of archaeological survey. When you get to something like a field system, um, as annotated here, um, and this drawing features in the published volume, volume five of the Clare Island survey, you get into something of a completely different scale. You have an area at the west end of the island, which is um, well over um, 500 metres um, across and um, uh, again, close to, almost close to a kilometre in the north-south axis. And what you see there is a whole palimpsest of archaeological features right up to the uh, turf stands, which are highlighted in red. I'm afraid my face is obscuring um, the key to this diagram, but you can consult it in the volume. And then going back to the walls, which are um, serpent, uh, serpentine, um, black out in a, a black in outline, and these predate um, the growth of turf on the island. And in that area, um, where monument number uh, E ninety four E one six three was excavated by Paula King, she proved that these walls were pre 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 um, uh, bog pre pre bog growth and dated probably to the centuries just before the birth of Christ. In that instance, excuse me, I'm skipping back and forth here. Um, I'm going too fast, as it were. Um, the um, 
situation on Island Eddy is different. Um, we do not have a field system um, of uh, that antiquity, but what we do have is um, these seaweed markers. I mentioned um, that there are a total of um, nine of them. Um, six of them are in situ um, on the north shore of what is called the South Malor. This uh, name Malor is quite fascinating because it actually is, um, is documenting um, a, a peculiar feature of the island where the sand spits and cobble spits to the north and south of the island um, fill more slowly with the tide and ebb more slowly with the tide than the surrounding coastland, of course, which is open to the sea. And Malor is a dialect word found in Connemara Irish, um, which um, has a variety of meanings. But here, quite clearly, the context indicates that it's the slow filling and slow emptying of these uh, effectively lagoon-like um, embayments uh, that has been documented. What's fascinating here is uh, this Air Corps photograph from 1953 shows you the boundaries between the um, seaweed uh, beds and the positioning of the markers um, is obviously indicating the um, um, ownership of the beds, which, according to um, Pat Birmingham and others, um, uh, were uh, rotated um, um, in order to give everybody a slice of, of um, a good, a good um, a slice of the, of the better growing beds for seaweed beds. So these nine humble seaweed markers actually mark um, gigantic monuments, which include um, archaeology below the um, tide mark. Um, and therefore, they're comparable in many ways to the landscape monuments which we saw on, on Clare Island. If we were to look at the um, um, broader view, I suppose, of the archaeology of an island like Island Eddy um, and say, well, are there field systems in inverted commas on this thing? The word system is um, uh, a bit of a misnomer, um, but it's the term that's used in archaeology. What we can see is that um, um, this image, which is caught from uh, Google Earth image in 2012, um, and you can see, um, if I can bring the highlighter in, where this is, it's north of the village. Um, north and west of the village, uh, the village being uh, again beneath my uh, crown, as it were, my head. And you can see on this image on the left hand side, a very clear outline of a tillage plot. Um, very, very large, um, almost um, 200 metres um, uh, on its longest axis. And what's fascinating about it, about it is that it has a very clear edge um, to the north and west. And that edge coincides with um, a bay-like feature, which is shown on the 1841 maps, but which has subsequently filled um, um, so that it's now just a sandy, shallow um, landing spot. Um, and quite clearly, um, the tillage plot is respecting that earlier bay and therefore uh, predates um, um, the infilling uh, of it. So it's probably a pre-famine uh, tillage plot. This then can be set against um, the field system on uh, I Clare Island, but the field system on Clare Island is is um, early uh, Iron Age in date. Um, this is possibly late 18th century, certainly early 19th century in date. And um, one would say that one is of equal importance to the other. Both are documenting social history, um, but traditionally we don't record them in archaeological circles. We leave it to the historians and to the um, geographers to look at them. But there's a good argument to be made here uh, that perhaps if we were vis visiting Clare Island, uh, um, where there is ample evidence for tillage ridges, that these should be included in full scale archaeological survey. They tend to fall between the two stools of um, folk life studies uh, and archaeology. And in the case of the Clare Island survey, were not recorded in any detail. Another of the monuments of Island Eddy, which is absolutely remarkable, is these set of nosts. Nost is a Scandinavian word, um, meaning effectively in modern um, Norwegian, I think, um, a boathouse. Um, but it has a variety of colloquial usages in Scotland. The term noost is used. And in Ireland, until very recently, nobody uttered the word nost. And the Archaeological Survey of Ireland until 2010 had only two nosts. Uh, and I'm including archaeological survey in the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland. Only two nosts um, were recorded. 
And uh, the set of notes that we uncovered in or identified in um, Island Eddy are well known to the locals. Um, they're known as cloches. Clush being another interesting dialect word, meaning a cleft. Uh, I think it's sometimes applied to um, pits dug for potatoes, uh, for clamping potatoes. You can see here the um, one of the sets. There are two sets of notes. Um, and you can see that there are these indentations, linear indentations cut into the cobble foreshore where the boats of the island um, community could lie. And we can see uh, something of those boats, 1953 Air Corps photograph, which if you look closely at it, you can actually see that uh, of the um, 16 nosts that are there, uh, two sets, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them have boats in place on this photograph. And that um, these these boats could be, can be tied in terms of their quantity, also tied in terms of their their, their placement to particular houses. Houses possessed nosts. So while uh, Island Eddy doesn't have any conventional harbour, and in fact petitioned for a harbour for many years, um, to no good effect, um, they did have their own very unique system for uh, berthing boats, and they were very safe berthages. Um, and um, have endured to the present day, though they're not used now actively. This is a view of the said nosts um, taken possibly around 1960. Um, and looking at the individual pukons, um, some of these can still be identified. Some of them are still extant. Um, and they're sitting in the suite of Western nosts that we looked at earlier. Um, in the colour photograph, and you can actually tie these knots to the individual households. So while this, um, while this material um, and these monuments, as it were, um, the set of knots are very, very recent, um, they lie outside the traditional bounds of archaeology, they represent such a, a strikingly different way of organising your life, and particularly of organising your maritime affairs, um, that they are, um, as it were, epochs away from what most of us are used to in terms of contemporary culture. This looks ancient. And in fact, when I highlighted the Nosts first in Archaeology Ireland in 2010, um, a number of archaeologists said they must be Viking. Um, but in fact, there's no evidence that they date back to Viking times. Uh, they simply show an island community adapting um, very, very ably to local circumstances and utilising uh, the geography of their island to very good effect. Um, so they're quite a remarkable series and uh, unparalleled to my knowledge anywhere else. In if you also look at the house clusters, um, they are um, present on both islands. This is the distribution of house clusters on the 1840 map of Clare Island. Uh, I've put on also the two Bully settlements that were identified uh, during the archaeological survey. Um, and when you look at them, um, you can see um, particularly if you look at the first edition map, um, the population density and the way which the population of Clare Island was organised uh, before the famine. Clare Island population was halved, um, I think, from around 16 or 1700 down to about eight, 900 or 800 um, in the course of the famine. Um, and subsequently, many of these um, house clusters were partially or wholly abandoned when the Congested Districts Board bought uh, Clare Island and reorganised the holdings and the townland boundaries um, between 1895 and I think the early years of the 20th century. What's interesting is um, the scale of these uh, meant that during the Royal Irish Academy's new survey of Clare Island, um, they were not studied in IGT. In fact, it wasn't until John Feehan um, was doing research for his capstone volume on Clare Island, which was published only, I think, um, last year, uh, that um, one of these um, um, house clusters was investigated by him at Glen. This is the house cluster here. Um, and he um, has gathered a number of interesting uh, facts about that house cluster from local memory. But these house clusters um, were not covered in any great detail. They were, they were certainly documented and um, their existence, but they were not studied. In contrast to this, um, because the scale of the work of the scale of uh, Island Eddy, where there is only one house cluster, um, it has allowed us as archaeologists in the survey work there um, to do um, archaeological survey, as it were, of vernacular uh, buildings, and particularly this group of vernacular buildings. Uh, archaeologists have only recently, in the last couple of decades, embraced 
the study of uh, vernacular architecture of the 18th and 19th and early 20th century. It's been something that's left up to the uh, folk life people, um, the anthropologists, as it were. Uh, but anthropologists tend to take, um, I suppose, a, um, a different view um, of vernacular houses than archaeologists would. Archaeologists would tend to treat each one as unique and accord each one um, uh, the same amount of time. Um, folklorists uh, and folk life people would tend to uh, study a representative sample um, and not treat uh, each house uh, in the same manner. In the case of Island Eddy, we've been working on this on and off for about seven or eight years now. Um, and we've been producing, none of these are yet published, different um, sets of map and textual analysis of the houses. This particular image here is buildings by category um, and the labelling S for shed, B for barn, um, C for corn stand um, has allowed us to study in great detail the layout of the houses. Um, the first thing that we have been able to determine is that the uh, the fabric of the houses as um, it existed in 1841 is almost completely different than the fabric of the houses that survive today. Um, so there's almost a 100% replacement of fabric uh, pre and post famine, possibly to do with the improvement in housing conditions. Material of the houses, the actual stone is probably the original stone, but it's been reconfigured in almost every case. Um, so again, this work, which has embraced um, building orientation, the fact that many of the houses, as you can see here, uh, face, um, well, you can't see it from this, but they all face north. Um, there's a subset which face um, um, uh, east. Um, you can see a couple of them here. Um, and has allowed us to carry out interesting analysis on um, ownership, family names, um, the descendants of Ireland Eddie um, Facebook page, um, people active in that they, um, have allowed us to identify the family which occupied each of the houses on the island at different times. So this is all data that's been compiled in conjunction with local community research uh, and is going to produce a very, very interesting and detailed picture of the houses uh, when we get around to publishing it. Coming to the end of the talk now, um, funding um, is an issue. Um, it always is uh, one of these conversation pieces. What's interesting about the two surveys in terms of comparison and contrast is the fact um, that we had a generous amount of money as opposed to no money. And there are implications behind that. Implications to do with deadlines and to do with bureaucracy. It's not so long ago, I think I remember Liz Fitzpatrick in her role as editor of the Royal Irish Academy Proceedings talking about the fact that most of her um, work life at, uh, at that time, this is about seven or eight years ago, she said uh, was reporting on what I'm supposed to be researching rather than concentrating on the research. So bureaucracy um, and accounting um, accompany funding. Um, and there is a certain freedom accorded to one uh, when one works privately, um, in this case, not privately, but in a community setting. Um, it gives you that freedom, but it also uh, means that you must um, put your own money where your interest lies. We pride ourselves in the survey we've been doing um, for uh, Island Eddy on community engagement. Um, and one of the things that um, I certainly have learned, um, and it was a steep learning curve, is that the absence of any formal engagement with the island community by the um, Clare Island survey um, um, produced quite a few rumbling problems with the community. The community on Clare Island had traditionally called the first surveyors, um, led by Robert Lord Prager in 1911 to 1915. They were known as Pragers. And that name, whatever um, its implications originally, by the time it came to 1991-92, there was an edge to the label. Um, being called a Prager was not necessarily uh, praise, <laughs> if you get my meaning. Um, so I lament the fact um, that no community, formal community engagement was, in, was um, involved in the original Royal Irish, Academy, uh, Royal Irish Academy survey. And what I mean by that is fully getting the community on board. So they're part of the survey. They're not bystanders. Um, and it's that element of being a bystander when a stranger is coming in and photographing and walking your land um, that I'm getting at. That's what community engagement is evolved about. So in the case of Island Eddy, the fact that we all live locally, 
albeit that every one of us, almost every one of us involved, and there are about six, uh, are blow-ins. Um, the fact that we have uh, interviewed um, surviving islanders um, and consulted um, with landowners on the island uh, whenever possible uh, about what we're finding and about local history and place names, etc. Um, this has given us um, a deeper insight, I think, um, albeit on a smaller scale, so therefore it's easier to do this, but it gives us a much deeper insight into the island history. And um, one of the great highlights of, of that work has been um, taking lectures to local public houses. Um, not something we can do at the moment and maybe never do again, but um, it was one of, certainly what be one of the highlights uh, of packing out public houses in various spots uh, around Galway Bay um, on a Monday or Tuesday night um, um, to deliver reflections and lectures and discussions on the work they're doing. Publications by um, necessity um, are linked to funding. So the series of 11 volumes being produced by the Royal Irish Academy are absolutely magnificent. Um, the ninth or 10th volume in the series rather is uh, on birds is being launched, I think, uh, this month. Um, check out the Royal Irish Academy website uh, as highlighted there and you'll get the details on it. Um, in Island Eddie, what we've done is we've created a Wiki Wikipedia page uh, on the island. Uh, I'm one of the chief moderators of that. Um, and we published what we call occasional papers, uh, wherever the whim takes us, local national journals. We've also um, been cognizant of the fact that some people's research um, is not fully within or doesn't fit neatly within the confines of academia. Um, in other words, um, if, uh, as in the case of Breener Work, um, one of my colleagues in GMIT uh, in Galway, now retired, um, did research and wrote a song about the island. Um, you know, is that research? Um, in our book, it is. Um, and therefore, um, that features in uh, our publication list. So we have tried to use social media. Um, we've avoided um, Twitter. Um, we've avoided um, WhatsApp. Um, but we've engaged uh, Wikipedia and we work closely with the uh, those who moderate the Descendants of Island Eddy Facebook page, uh, all to good. The end is nigh. So how uh, are we to assess? Uh, when I see the word lessons, um, I run. Uh, I don't like lessons, but there's a couple of observations that I could make uh, that might be useful. Uh, first of all, we began the um, Clare Island survey in a time uh, when Ireland was on the up, as it were, in 1991. Uh, we began the Island Eddy survey at a time when Ireland, Ireland was on its toes or on its knees, rather, um, economic collapse. And um, what struck us um, in the years we've been doing, it's now a full decade since we began work on Island Eddy, is that um, we treat it as a leisure activity. We try to keep the standards as high as possible. Um, we moderate one another. Um, we send our articles to journals, which are not necessarily peer reviewed, though at least a couple of them have been. Um, so, but we see it as a leisure time activity and yet a professional leisure time activity. We also see it, uh, and this is quite important, as an interdisciplinary survey. Um, one of the things that surprises me in many ways about the publication series of the Clare Island survey is that I find out things uh, about uh, Clare Island uh, for the first time when I open the volumes. Um, and I think that's kind of sad. And it emphasizes the fact that what was happening um, in the Clare Island survey was, was a, a multidisciplinary approach. The botanists went and botanized, the archaeologists went and surveyed. Uh, and while we met sometimes in the hotel or down in McCabe's, uh, we didn't formally cooperate. Uh, whereas on the smaller scale survey on Island Eddy, um, interdisciplinary is the key word. The other thing that comes out from this, uh, it's particularly true um, in the case of um, mainland archaeology, but it has a role um, and it has a lesson that we've learned in island archaeology is that legislative protection is um, too complicated um, and that the division between what is called built heritage and natural heritage is a completely artificial one. So that when we went and visited the children's burial ground on Island Eddy, um, we were able to map its limits uh, on the basis of the vegetation rather than on the markings 
for the graves, which of course were uh, are only two graves in that children's burial ground are marked, and quite clearly there are many more than two children in that um, um, special place. But it's uh, it's quite fascinating that uh, if you work with directly with the botanist, you can map the limits of the graveyard on the basis of vegetation, and that vegetation is only apparent at certain seasons of the year. The last uh, but one um, reflection is that funding is an option, but it's not a necessity. You can do an awful lot of work without high tech archaeology. Um, and sometimes I think our profession forgets that. Um, local and amateur archaeologists don't forget it. Um, but uh, I'm just re-emphasizing uh, that much can be achieved without funding. And lastly, um, I think the key lesson that I've learned from these two surveys is that community participation is a must. It's increasingly a must because communities are now much more vocal and active um, uh, and more interested in their heritage than they were even as recently as 30 years ago. And I always lament the fact that no sociological stroke anthropological survey was conducted amongst the community of Clare Island in the 1990s when we were active there. Um, I would see that uh, as a fundamental part of um, any future work um, on islands, um, but also on all communities, um, be they inshore, offshore or onshore. Thank you very much. The second presentation of Session 2 of Land, Sea and Sky, the Archaeology of Coasts and Islands brings us to a group of islands in the North Atlantic. Angela Gannon is an archaeological investigator with Historic Environment Scotland. She has participated in several major field survey projects across the length and breadth of Scotland, recording everything from prehistoric landscapes of burial tombs, hut circles and cairn fields, to 19th century industrial landscapes of coal mining and stone quarrying. Her most notable achievement to date is as co-author of St Kilda, The Last and Outmost Isle, which was nominated for three book awards and is the subject of this presentation of the same name, St Kilda, the Last and Outmost Isle. The islands of St Kilda are a remarkable archipelago that rises dramatically from the Atlantic Ocean some 45 miles west of Scotland's Outer Hebrides. For many, the islands epitomise the romantic notions of isolation, insularity and a life on the edge of the world. Yet while there is no doubt that the archaeological remains there are exceptional, and represent unique responses to such a distant and dramatic landscape, it is equally clear that life here can only have been sustained if the islands belonged to a much wider social and economic network. It is this connectivity that makes life on St Kilda so enduring and its story so interesting. Hello everyone and thank you so much for the invitation to speak at this year's conference. I must confess that I'm truly gutted that I can't travel to Dublin to meet you all in person. But such is life, and I don't imagine any one of us could have predicted how the last few months would have unfolded. Indeed, our insularity may well have been our salvation had we lived a few hundred years ago. But instead, it's our connectivity and our ability to travel that has effectively led to this coronavirus pandemic and the restrictions now imposed upon us. Anyway, I'm here today to talk to you about St Kilda. St Kilda is a place I first heard of as a young girl growing up in Scotland, and I've had a fascination with the place ever since. Little did I know then that I would get the opportunity to go there in a professional capacity many, many years later, and to spend weeks there recording the archaeological remains, and then, even more amazingly, get the chance to write a book about the islands. But first of all, where is St Kilda? St Kilda is a tiny group of islands cast adrift in the Atlantic Ocean, some 100 miles from the west coast of mainland Scotland. The archipelago comprises four islands, Herta, Dun, Soe and Borrerie, and three stacks, Levinish, which guards the approach to Village Bay on Herta, and Stack Lee and Stack and Armin, both to the west of Borrerie. While the whole archipelago has been intensively exploited at one time or another, the focus of settlement always appears to have been in Village Bay on Herta. St Kilda is renowned for its dramatic landscape and its extensive seabird colonies, and its most recent history is one of recognition and protection. 
St Kilda is a World Heritage Site and in this it occupies a unique position in the UK insofar as it is the UK's only dual World Heritage Site and indeed only one of 39 across the globe. It holds this on account of its natural and cultural heritage and while it is the cultural heritage designation that led to our mapping survey and my fieldwork on the islands, in terms of its natural heritage the islands boast some of the highest sea cliffs in Europe, the largest colony of seabirds in northern Europe, its own subspecies of wren and wood mouse, and they also support two unique breeds of sheep, both rare survivals of primitive types, and one of which dates back to prehistory. And it's against this dramatic natural backdrop that we can set the island's human history which for many ended with the evacuation of the last 36 inhabitants on the 29th of August in 1930. This is a view perpetuated until quite recently in such publications as Charles Maclean's Island on the Edge of the World, which laments the loss of a way of life and the desertion of a landscape. However, contrary to popular belief, the last islanders actually petitioned the UK government to assist them to leave and to help them find new homes on the Scottish mainland. They were not forcibly evicted from their homes, this was no Highland clearance, but rather they wanted to go. So poignant though this moment may be, it is just one part of the remarkable story of St Kilda, a story which we'll soon see stretches back into prehistory and still continues today. But far from being the last human presence on Herta, in 1957, the 5th Marquess of Butte bequeathed the archipelago to the National Trust for Scotland and almost simultaneously the Ministry of Defence established a radar tracking station in Village Bay on Herta, the main island of the group. The flat roofed forest green blocks of these 20th century defence installations are the first features encountered by people arriving in Village Bay today and incongruous though they might be, they are nevertheless part of the island's continuing human story. They are still part of a missile testing range operating from Binbecula in the Outer Hebrides and while staff numbers to service the range have dropped significantly over the years, a complement of around 10 still reside on, the, reside on the island, albeit on a temporary and rotational basis. Their continuing presence effectively made our own survey there logistically possible. Our archaeological survey was carried out over three years between 2007 and 2009, following the extended designation of St Kilda as a World Heritage Site to include its cultural landscape. The survey was undertaken in partnership with colleagues from the National Trust for Scotland and our remit on this occasion was to provide a detailed historic environment record of the islands and fully integrated within a geographic information system. And here you see the DREAMS team in action in 2008. My colleague Ian Parker mapping the cleat, Jill Harden of the National Trust conducting the record photography and myself writing the site notes. The data captured during the survey provided a management tool for the National Trust and allows for the monitoring of this cultural resource. I should perhaps mention here that we'll look at cleats much later on, but they are essentially multiple purpose dry stone storehouses or basically stone sheds and they're unique to St Kilda. They were used for drying and storage of seabirds, eggs, peats and crops. For us embarking on the survey, it did seem quite remarkable that there was not an accurate map of the features at the beginning of the 21st century. In reality, Herta was the last inhabited island to be mapped and published by the Ordnance Survey having been omitted from the coverage of Harris and North Uist some 50 years earlier. For St Kilda, the first Ordnance Survey map appeared in 1928 and was based on mapping work undertaken the previous year by one of its retired officers, John Matheson. And this always strikes me as sadly ironic as this was only three years before the islanders left for their new homes on the Scottish mainland. So while St Kilda's isolated position had attracted countless generations of seafarers, their very remoteness had done little to inspire mapmakers. 
In every respect, St Kilda captured the romantic notion of remoteness and isolation, of people surviving against the odds in an extreme environment and of living life on the edge of the world. This was a place where people played out their lives within closely defined physical boundaries, free from external influences and in control of their own destinies. As such, the sea is not so much a vast expanse of nothingness, but a barrier and a cause of insularity. But is this not a modern misconception? My choice, of, my choice of title for this presentation, and indeed the book we published almost five years ago now, St Kilda, The Last and Outmost Isle, only reinforces St Kilda's distant location. This was a phrase first penned in 1527 by Hector Boyce, first principal of King's College in Aberdeen in his history of the Scottish people. Here he describes a strange and remote island populated with prehistoric sheep, girt by steep cliffs, and that could only be reached by a treacherous journey across open water. But more importantly, what he did in writing these words was to bring this remarkable archipelago to the attention of a wider audience, and in doing so, he sparked a fascination that continues to the present day. Indeed, so powerful is this fascination that over 700 books, articles and accounts have now been written about St Kilda. Few of these have been written by people who have actually ventured to St Kilda, and even less by St Kildans themselves. But while accepting St Kilda's peripheral geographical position, its remoteness should perhaps be reappraised, not in terms of marginality and distance, but more in terms of its connectivity and links with a much wider world. For myself working on St Kilda, Yes, there's absolutely no doubt I felt cut off and remote, but I also realised how much I depended on contact with the outside world, even if it was by satellite phone to keep in touch with my family and by ensuring that the helicopter made its twice weekly deliveries of fresh fruit and veg. Today, technology allows us to do things differently, but the same need for social and economic interaction is just as relevant now as it has been in the past. Ever since Neolithic times, the sea was not simply a backdrop, but an active medium conveying plants, animals and a material culture, as well as an understanding of technologies and architecture. Perhaps it's time to rethink our narratives and focus not so much on St Kilda looking in, but on St Kilda looking out. And this image very neatly encapsulates this notion, standing on the slopes overlooking Village Bay and looking out across the sea and beyond. Before the luxury of travelling by helicopter to St Kilda, reaching there must always involve travel by boat and across open water. And this is as true today as it has been throughout history and prehistory. On a clear day, the cloud capped silhouettes of Herta and Borrery can be seen interrupting the Atlantic horizon some 45 miles west of North Uist, one of the islands of the Outer Hebrides. Working in North Uist several years ago and witnessing this for myself made me appreciate these visible connections between the islands and this intervisibility must surely have inspired the earliest visitors to St Kilda. This was without a doubt where the land, sea and sky met. Quite when the first settlers pulled their boats up onto the foreshore is unknown, but it seems likely that the people have lived on the archipelago since prehistoric times, exploiting the rich resources of the sea, growing crops and keeping animals. An indication of an early presence is provided by two shards of Neolithic pottery discovered in 1996 by Andrew Fleming and Mark Edmonds on the Roding Cliff Edge in Village Bay. These shards have diag diagonal in size decoration on the reverted rims, in keeping with wares from the Hebrides, examples of which are paralleled, such as at Ilion and T on North Uist. And to these can be added pollen grains preserved in the Herta peat that reveal that the first cereal crops were being grown shortly before 3000 BC. But where were they cultivated? 
While our survey found plenty of new evidence for the stone tools that would have supported a arable economy, there is still much debate about their extent and date. Fragments of stone tools are incorporated into the consumption dikes and heaps of field clearance from the croftlands around Village Bay, and just as many, if not more, of these stone tools have been found recycled into the walls of later buildings, especially the cleats. Indeed, the earliest securely dated context for the stone tools comes from structures belonging to the Iron Age. This brings me to a key point about our understanding of the archaeology of St Kilda. Working on St Kilda brought many challenges, not only confronting the drama of the landscape, the steep slopes and the sheer cliffs, but also the recognition that this physical geography had constrained areas for settlement and cultivation. So just as there is the inevitable, inevitable bias in the historical records, I've already mentioned that there, there are over 700 books or accounts written about St Kilda, so too is there one in the archaeological record. In other words, the most attractive areas for settlement and land use have been continually reused and reoccupied, meaning that the chances of finding evidence for er from earlier periods, especially prehistory, have become severely reduced over time. Although it's possible that St Kilda was included in some way in the networks that developed throughout the Atlantic Seaways during the Neolithic and Bronze Age, the evidence for this is scanty to say the least. To add to the Neolithic pottery shards we've just seen, there are antiquarian accounts of stone coffins discovered in Village Bay during the agriculture improvements in the early 19th century. To all intents and purposes, these sound like early Bronze Age kists. However, it is the Iron Age that provides the first structural evidence, a souterrain or underground passage known as the House of the Fairies, found by accident by a man digging the ground above it. Subsequent excavations at the souterrain have revealed its full extent, including side chambers and the footings that may represent the building with which the souterrain was associated at ground level. The stone artefacts recovered during these excavations are of interest as they include tools made from cobbles, such as pounders and smoothers, which were probably used in the preparation of food, together with scale knives, which while they are prevalent on Neolithic and Bronze Age sites in Orkney and Shetland, they also occur in early Iron Age contexts on Orkney. Amongst the pottery too, there were shards that fit into the wider ceramic traditions of Atlantic Scotland, comparable to those dis uh, discovered from Neep on Lewis and Solis on North Uist. So once again, connections back to the islands with which they are intervisible. Stepping further into the first millennium AD brings the establishment of the Celtic Christian Church and novel rites and practices. St Kilda has long been considered a candidate for the location of an eremitic site on account of its remote location and its dedications to St Brian and otherwise St Brendan and St Columba. While there is no structural evidence of this date so far recorded, there are three cross incised stones of which two have been dated to between the 8th and 10th centuries AD by their typological similarity to other early Christian examples. The third, which was found during the course of our survey, is also likely to be early, but it has no direct analogy in Scotland. They were all discovered within 150 metres of the oval-shaped burial ground, which is situated a little to the north of the street, running through the township on Village Bay. All three crosses have been reused in later structures, one as a coin of a window, in one of the cottages, another as a roof lintel in one of the cleats, and the other, newly discovered, um, has been reused as a cover slab of a drain running between two houses on the street. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle provides a vivid record of the first Norse arrival in Britain in AD 787. And we know that St Columba's Monastery on Iona was pillaged three times in AD 795, 802 and 806. 
the Atlantic Seaways passing south along both the east and west coast of the Outer Hebrides towards Iona, the Isle of Man and onto Ireland, would have provided sheltered routes and it seems likely that provisions were sought along the west coast of Scotland. We know next to nothing about how violent and frequent these initial incursions may have been, but in time this period of raiding gave way to colonisation and the establishment of farming communities. Once occupied, the Outer Hebrides remained part of the Norse world until their, until their succession to the Scottish Crown in 1266. However, and not unlike the Outer Hebrides, the most widespread evidence for Norse activity on St Kilda is represented not by archaeological remains, but by place names and a few stray artefacts. This brooch, presumably from a Viking woman's grave amongst them. Within Village Bay, there are a number of corbelled and cellular buildings that predate both the establishment of the pre-improvement township and the crofts of the late 19th century. These we believe to be medieval in date, so pre-1600, and they bear close comparison in their terms of their size um, with structures excavated elsewhere, in particular those found on Lewis, which also have corbelled side chambers generally contained within the thickness of the walls. This is Callum Moore's house, which is described as an old cellar in 1875 and incorporates at least one ruinous side cell. While those that can be identified in Village Bay may have been modified and adapted over the years, the cellular buildings in Glen Moor, the north facing bay on Herta, appear relatively unaltered. The best preserved of these is that known as the Amazon's House, and there have been sustained attempts to push the structure back in time with some drawing on affinities with Iron Age wheelhouses. Much more likely, and certainly the interpretation favoured by ourselves, is that this is just one of the many structures in Glenmore, built and used as shielding huts. Shielding, or transhumance, is a practice universal in the Outer Hebrides at this time, and on St Kilda it is well attested both by the place name Airy Moor, meaning Big Shielding, and implicit in the description in the late 17th century when islanders were said to stay in Glen Moore all summer. Until now, I've only been describing the archaeological remains on Herta, the main island of the archipelago. Our survey team also made it onto Borrowry, the most remote island of the group, which has long been regarded as a satellite of Herta, a view maintained until the early 20th century when the St Kildans would visit during the summer months, sea fowling and plucking sheep wool, staying in the bothies and storing their catch in the cleats. For my colleagues, making the trip to Borrowry brought home just how much the St Kildans were at the mercy of the wind and waves. And for those of us left behind on Herta, it highlighted the emotional angst faced by the women, watching and waiting to see whether their husbands and sons and in this case, their male colleagues, made it back home safely. Borrowry too generated some excitement with the discovery of three settlement mounds, one of which is shown here, underlies a cleat and incorporates a dry stone cell with a seemingly intact corbelled roof. This is strongly reminiscent of the so-called Amazon's house on Herta, for which a late medieval date has been mooted. As work progressed, it soon became clear that these mounds appeared to be related to an extensive multi-phase field system situated on the steep south-facing slope of the island, where a head dike separates the upper slopes used for grazing from the lower ground. This arrangement recalls the late medieval system of infield and outfield and must surely relate to an attempt to permanently occupy and cultivate the island. As the islanders who created this field system had to live somewhere, these so-called settlement mounds are the most likely candidates. St Kilda is surprisingly rich in remains dating to the 17th and 18th centuries, and with the exception of those connected with fouling, which we'll come on to in due course, 
These conform to the same general arrangements as found elsewhere on the MacLeod estate. St Kilda had become part of the territory of the MacLeods of Harris at some point before 1549, and the islands remained in their hands until 1779, when they were forced to sell much of their estate to fend off bankruptcy. The township, described by Martin in 1697, is indistinguishable from any other in the Outer Hebrides, <coughs> though its location in Village Bay on Herta has only recently been confirmed. While we have documentary accounts and depictions of the township in the early years of the 19th century, and this is one of them here, the rebuilding of the houses and agricultural improvements in Village Bay in the 1830s and onwards have now but all but removed the township. All we have left are shadowy rectangular platforms and low scarps suggesting the outline of former buildings. But while the township has largely been swept away, extensive remains of the pre-crofting enclosure and cultivation are preserved in both Village Bay and Glenmore. In Village Bay, these take the form of small walled enclosures, some of which have been modified and continued in use, together with low banks and scarps. These are clearly pre-crofting in origin as they underlie the head dike and croft boundaries. Further plots of cultivated ground have been recorded elsewhere on Herta, Dune and Borrowry, and at least one of these can be assigned confidently to the mid 18th century. This is encountered on an exposed rocky east facing slope on the west flanks of Glenmore, and is an area of lazy bed cultivation contained within a ruinous rubble wall. This type of cultivation is almost ubiquitous in northwestern Scotland, albeit that few examples have been closely dated. It seems likely that this corresponds to Macaulay's account of an attempt of cultivation on the northwest of the island a few years before 1758 at the behest of the taxman a Macleod of Pabby. For much of its recent history, St Kilda has, was effectively part of a farm along with the island of Pabby, owned by the Macleod chiefs based at Dunvegan on Skye. Arguably, the archaeology on Pabby is better preserved and just as important, but it is an island neglected in the literature and lacks the romanticism of a long boat journey and a dramatic cliff-bound coastline. We've already touched on the shealing huts in Glenmore, and it's very likely that some of these continued in use into the 18th century. Certainly, the St Kildans continued to use Glenmore for summer pasture of their sheep and cattle, repairing and adapting these old shealing huts. Some of these are found in association with enclosures and dry stone cells, and these have been described as gathering folds. While these gathering folds are found in association with the shealing huts, they are clearly secondary. We've recorded a total of 14, and each has a similar layout comprising two walls that funneled the sheep into the fold, which was then closed off. A number of dry stone cells opened directly off the fold, and these were used to shelter the lambs and separate them from the ewes. This allowed the islanders to take a proportion of the milk for themselves. The practice is described by Captain Frederick Thomas during his study of St Kilda in the summer of 1860, and this practice continued into the 1920s. The overnight penning of ewes and lambs in such structures may well have been commonplace during the post-medieval period in the Outer Hebrides, and we ourselves have recently recorded examples on Harris, South Uist, and indeed on Rum. St Kilda was the only part of the MacLeod estate that practised fowling extensively, though the harvesting of seabirds and their eggs was undertaken throughout most of coastal Scotland in the 17th and 18th centuries. While it can be demonstrated that cultivation took place on three of the main islands, Herta, Dune and Borrowry, and grazing on four, Herta, Dune, Borrowry and Soe, Fowling also extended to the two sea stacks of Borrowry, Stack Lee and Stack and Arman. The structures associated with fowling are limited to three types, ephemeral nooks with just a few 
uh, stones that were used during the hunting of seabirds, bothies used by the hunters for accommodation, and cleats used for the storage of the produce of hunting and gathering. In most cases, the association of these structures with fowling relies entirely on their location as they have no distinctive architectural traits. The cleats of St Kilda are by far the most numerous and distinctive feature of the islands. We've mapped over 1300 on Herta, 60 on Borrery, 33 on Soe and 80 on Stack and Arman. Cleats are narrow, sub-rectangular dry stone buildings roofed with transverse lintels and covered with a cap of earth and stone. They're usually aligned up and down a slope and are provided with an entrance entered from or towards the upslope end. While it's probable that the tradition of building cleats developed with the need to store a large quantity of eggs and fowl, the earliest references occur in the 17th and 18th centuries when they were also in use as peat stores. Martin noted the existence of, existence of about 40 on Borrery and several on Stack and Arman in 1697, and at the same time estimated that there were about 500 in the archipelago. So this accounts for about a third of those known today. So there's little doubt that some of those present today were in existence in 1697. Peat and turf were vital commodities on the islands, as they could be used as building materials or fuel. We've seen turf used to roof the cleats and peats were then cut to dry and burn on the hearths. In practice, several large areas of land surface and, and herta have been depleted through the wholesale removal of turf and peat over many centuries. And this is particularly evident above the modern head dike in Village Bay, which you see here, where the cleats have, can be seen perched upon the remnants of an earlier land surface. The archaeology of St Kilda during the 150 years before the evacuation reflects wider patterns of change that are recognisable throughout much of rural Scotland. This was a time of agricultural improvement which resulted in the wholesale replacement of the country's agricultural buildings, the reorganisation of much of the land and the development and specialisation of smaller industries. For St Kilda, it brought a very different township layout from the huddle of buildings we saw earlier to one of 23 new black houses, of which 19 survive, each effectively a small farmstead strung out along the metal trackway known as the street. Black houses were single roomed buildings which accommodated cattle at one end over the winter months. Each of the farmsteads was provided with at least one cleat, a midden, and a walled kale yard or small enclosure for cultivation. At the same time, there was a redistribution of the agricultural land and a move from the fields and enclosures allotted every few years and cultivated by the whole community to one where each family had their own specific croft. This was the time when Village Bay took on the fan-like appearance we recognise today where a series of straight boundaries divides the arable land into 18 long, thin, rectilinear plots. The whole was then enclosed by a new head dike, pierced by openings that permit access between the cultivated land of the crofts and the gruff, rough grazing beyond. A new suite of 16 cottages was constructed following the destruction uh, wrought by a hurricane over the 27th and 28th of September in 1860. These were of a standard Hebridean design with an entrance lobby, a closet behind the two main rooms. For the most part, the sites of these cottages were chosen to fit between existing buildings and enclosures. However, some necessitated, some necessitated the removal of black houses or cleats. This new arrangement has each cottage set along the slope facing towards the sea, an arrangement that amplified the availability of light into the interiors. These were the homes of the last St Kildans, and the six that have been restored, they're the ones that you can see here with the black bitumen roofs, 
These provided accommodation for us during our survey, as well as the many work parties that now attend to ongoing conservation work. So that is not so much a canter as a gallop um, through the corpus of archaeological structures on St Kilda. As I hope you've realised, the St Kildans cultivated the ground, tended their stock and harvested seabirds, just as other remote communities across the western and northern isles of Scotland. So in many ways, they are more similar than they are different. If St Kilda has a story to tell, it is one of endurance and perseverance. And that much became obvious to us during the course of our survey. And indeed, the harvesting of young gannets, or guga, is still carried out to this day on the remote island of Suliskir by the men of Ness from northwest Lewis. Arguably, St Kilda's remote location and the exploitation of the immense seabird colonies that nested around the island in stacks ensured that St Kilda remained populated much longer than many of the Hebridean islands closer to the Scottish mainland, where the tenants there were removed during the late 19th and early 20th centuries and the islands given over to sheep. Situating St Kilda within a broader geographical framework allows us to draw upon similar similarities where they exist. However, there is no doubt that the archaeological remains of St Kilda are indeed exceptional, and in the case of the many hundreds of cleats, they represent a very unique response to a very remarkable landscape. The fowling economy and the features associated with it have been part and parcel of St Kilda's daily lives from at least the 16th century. They are testament to the resilience and character of, of a people who made a living on the most dangerous and difficult group of islands. So surely it is time to reconsider St Kilda and its geographical position, not as isolated and remote, but as part of a much wider world. And in this respect, St Kilda's isolation is a description and not an explanation. Thanks very much. Um, and if you do want to find out more, my email contact um, was on the first slide and our book is still available in paperback form. Thank you.